So today, we will continue where we picked off. We will pick off where we left off last time around. And if you remember, one of the last thing, one of the last things we did last time around was looking at the bilateral trade example. So we had a seller and a buyer, and they were both the players in the mechanism. So none of them was the designer. And we ran VCG there, and we saw that the mechanism that we got, which was the second price auction, was not individually rational for the seller because the seller had to pay in order to keep the item. And the seller got nothing if they uh, had to sell the item. So this was not a good deal for them. So today we kind of ask the following question. Does there exist a mechanism for a bilateral trade example. So we will use this as a running example for today for the bilateral trade problem. That is satisfying the following criteria. It is efficient, obviously. This is the thing that we've been hunting for our whole lives in this course. We want it to be domain stretch incentive compatible because we do not know anything better. We want it to be individually rational and to, for concreteness, let's start with exposed individual rationality. And we want it to be exposed budget balanced. To have some counterweight on individually on the individual rationality. And so this is the question: does there exist a mechanism like that? So we know that VCG was not IR, but maybe we can find something else. VCG looks like it's not the only thing, right? Or we have no reason to assume that it's the only thing out there. And today what we will see is that it is the only thing out there, pretty much. And but we will prove this. And we will prove this using a cool result called revenue equivalence. So I will not give you the statement of revenue equivalence. I will not tell you what it means. But we will go through a series of derivations. And in the end, we will arrive to the result that we are proving. So it might seem like we are just wandering off in random direction at the start. But um, it will all come together at the end. At least it should. Before that. I would like to introduce a specific setting that we'll be working in. So we started off our, our journey in mechanism design with general setting, with just no structure in the problem. Then we specified it to quasi-linear settings, in which we have explicit access to transfers, and everyone's utility is linear in transfers. And now we will specify the quasi-linear setting even further, because that's what we will need for this whole result because we cannot answer this question in a in the quasi-linear setting. But bilateral trade and pretty much all other examples we saw so far uh, do, do fit this narrower um, framework. And I will call this framework the Euclidean model. You take the quasi-linear setting and you put the following assumptions on top. Firstly, we will assume that all types belong to an interval. So type is a number, and it's just one number. It's not a vector of numbers. We will say that everybody's type should be between theta lower bar i and theta upper bar i. And this is, just to be explicit, this is a real number. And there is full support. So I guess I'll write that too. Meaning that the common prior belief says that each of these types happens with positive density. All right, cool. Then we are assuming that our allocations also have a particular structure. And they are also given by numbers. So an allocation prescribes some number for every player. And again, you see that everything we've done so far kind of fits this. So in item allocation, ki would be the probability of getting the item, for example. 
in the public project, Ki would be the probability of the public project being implemented. And that Ki would be the same for everyone, obviously. In the bilateral trade, it's again the probability of getting the item for every player. And so we further assume that K is a compact convex set. So it's not just zero or one, but all values in between zero and one are also available for us. And finally, we will assume that utilities are given by the familiar expression Ki times theta i minus Ti. This is not the weakest setting in which you can show revenue equivalence, but it's the most... It is general enough to allow us to embed all our previous problems that we considered, and at the same time it is... Um, narrow enough for it to be easy to do so. So you can relax the setting a little bit, but uh, it will come at a cost of tractability. So maybe you do not, strictly speaking, need convexity of K. I think you probably need compactness. Uh, to, to fix ideas, what kind of problem would not fit the Euclidean setting? Maybe among those that we considered even, or a version of the problem that we considered. Well, what happens if we are allocating a few heterogeneous items? So I have two markers, black and red, and the red is also very thin, and I want to auction those off. Probably you would not have the same valuation for these two markers. All right? So then a player's type would be a vector of two values, of two valuations. Valuation for red marker, valuation for black marker. And that's what we are prohibiting here. We are saying that types should be one-dimensional, and that's important. A few last words about the Euclidean setting. First, the name. Many of you have never heard about the Euclidean setting, and if anything, not many, but all of you have never heard about the Euclidean setting, and uh, you probably will never hear about it again, because I made it up. It's just a special case of quasi-linear setting, uh, that's very useful for the space of equivalence, exactly. And I felt useful to just put it out explicitly rather than saying, you know, now we're considering quasi-linear model with one-dimensional things. You know, just give it a name. I call it Euclidean setting, but it's not a name that you will see again. So as I promised, we'll just strain to the forest and uh, we'll do random things. For the first thing, we'll just fix some arbitrary player and their type and uh, their possible deviation, theta hat, and some profile of types of other players, theta minus i. And we will write out the incentive constraint for this player of this type for deviating to this other report. So, and we already have fixed some direct revelation mechanism Gamma, because we know that this is without loss. Okay, so yeah, we, we already have some environment, we've come up with a mechanism, and we, we know that without loss, this is a direct revelation mechanism because they have a revelation principle, right? So we're skipping all that, and we're looking at, at that particular mechanism that implements something, probably. So, the incentive compatibility condition. Uh, before that, I wanted to introduce a definition here. So denote the big UI of theta i, theta minus i, to be just the, not the equilibrium utility, but the utility from telling the truth of type theta i given the profile of other types theta minus i. So it's just uh, small u i of x theta i, theta minus i given to type theta i. And our incentive compatibility condition can then be written as follows. So this utility, this equilibrium utility from telling the truth, should be larger than something. Then the utility of player i from misreporting their type to be theta i hat. while their true type is still theta i. 
Now we want to use the structure we had in our problem, so we know what exactly UI is. So UI is given by theta i times the allocation k i uh, from theta hat i to theta minus i minus the transfers the player i gets given this profile of reports. Now, this expression is almost, it's almost the utility of um, type theta i hat in equilibrium, so from telling the truth, with the only exception. So if this theta i had the hat, it would be exactly that. So let us add and subtract that term. So we will have theta i hat ki of this minus ti of this same thing plus theta minus theta hat times ki of this profile of report. All right, cool, just algebra so far. So we added and subtracted this term. And you see that this will be exactly the equilibrium utility of player i when their true type is state i hat and they're telling the truth and profile of other types is theta i, theta minus i. And now just rearrange this expression a little bit. We will obtain the following. So taking all the utilities to one side and everything to the other side. Get that ui theta i theta minus i minus utility type i player i type theta hat i theta minus i should be greater than or equal to theta minus theta hat times the allocation ki hat. Uh, theta i hat theta minus i. All right, cool. So this, this is just the result of our manipulations of the incentive compatibility condition. So we say that if our mechanism gamma is domain strategy incentive compatible, so it's, if it satisfies that condition, it will also satisfy this. But another condition that it should satisfy is the opposite kind of incentive compatibility. So it should not be profitable for type theta i hat to pretend to be type theta i. We will have kind of the same thing, right? ui of theta i hat theta minus i minus ui of theta i theta minus i should be greater than or equal to theta hat minus theta times k of theta i, theta minus i. And then if we take these two conditions, we can rewrite them in a slightly more illustrative way. So we will get that k um, now just to take a stance and assume that theta i is greater than theta i hat. It's just without loss, right? We don't care which of them is which. So if we do that, we can divide both sides of both equations by theta i minus theta i hat and rearrange them a little bit. And we will obtain that ki of theta i theta minus i should be greater than this difference in utilities u i theta i theta minus i minus u i theta i hat theta minus i and this fraction should be greater than our other allocation, k 
of theta i hat theta minus i. And just taking the two edges of this inequality, we get the following statement. If gamma is dominant strategy incentive compatible, then well, if theta i is greater than theta i hat, for any i and for any profile of other types theta minus i, well, and I guess we should specify these as well, types of theta i. So this inequality on types implies this inequality on allocations. I'll call this a theorem. And it will be called um, monotonicity. So what, we, what did we just do? What did we just prove? We proved that in Euclidean setting, any mechanism that's incentive compatible must have a monotone allocation, meaning that higher types get higher allocations, given profile of everybody else's types. So to just put it in slightly more intuitive terms, uh, we can say that, to put it into an application, again, let's say we're auctioning off an item, the simplest application of the Euclidean setting, so we have one item, we are selling it off. What this says is that if a, the, the higher is my valuation, the higher is the probability with which I will get the item. This is the only way in which the mechanism will be incentive compatible. Okay, so this is monotonicity. And what preceded it was the proof of monotonicity. So we should be happy, except we were trying to get revenue equivalent and not monotonicity. But we can now use this monotonicity to get revenue equivalence. There's one other way that I can say this while I'll be erasing this, is that monotonicity is necessary for mechanism gamma to be dominant strategy incentive compatible. So if you are trying to implement some allocation rule K which is not monotone, you are going to fail. And this is not a threat, this is math. Cool. So now we're going to use this monotonicity to get to revenue equivalence. By the way, so which properties of the setting did we use? We did use the fact that theta was one dimensional because we divided things by theta i minus theta i hat. So we just used, we, we pretty much used this multiplicative part for sure. So we used the fact that both types and allegations k are one dimensional. But we have not really, we did not need full support, we did not need the fact that k is convex or anything like that. Okay, now a mathematical result that I will give you, statement which may seem very familiar, which may seem very new, depending on how much math you've seen. I remember it was a big revelation to me as a student, even though I should have known it probably. So our allocation k is monotone in theta i, which means that it is also continuous almost everywhere, in theta i, or continuous in theta i almost everywhere. So for all but measure zero of points theta i. What does it mean? It means that uh, if we draw this as a function, so again, fix some theta minus i, this will be theta i, this will be ki theta i, theta minus i. If we draw this allocation function in this graph, we will get something that's continuous almost everywhere. 
which means that given that our domain for theta is somewhere like this, so it's theta lower bar i, theta upper bar i, this interval has some positive Lebesgue measure. And the function will be continuous on this. So it will be, it can look like this. It can look like this. Something else. But it, it does not need to be absolutely continuous. It may have some discontinuities, but there will be at most measure zero of those. So we have one point of discontinuity, we have another point of discontinuity. We have them, we get third point of discontinuity and so on. But once you take the total measure of these points, it will be zero. You are very confused right now. Why do we need it? And what use is a continuity like that if it does not actually say that our allocation is continuous? Because it doesn't, right? So it does not give us any power economically, but it gives us a lot of power mathematically. And if anyone can phrase a question to this at this time, then it's a good time to phrase a question. So two parts. The first one I understood. The second one I'm not sure. The first part said that uh, there can be, they said there can be at most finite number of discontinuities. There can be more of those. So there cannot be, there can be countably many discontinuities. Uh, I'm not sure about uncountable. No, so okay. There can be even uncountably many discontinuities. I believe. But yeah, so just if you take the total measure of those points, it will be measure zero. It's the, the measures on a continuum are a bit of a pain to, to sort out and try to understand intuitively. Measure is the length of an interval. So the length of this domain is just theta i minus theta, right? So if we take an interval, it'll just be length. If we take a set consisting of a few intervals, it will be the sum of their lengths. If we take a collection of points, then kind of any given point has measure zero. But once you have enough points to form an interval, they'll have a positive measure. So if you can draw a mental wedge between how many points are individual points and how many points are composed together an interval, then that's the line between how many points of discontinuity we can have. So I realize it's not very clear, but uh, it's one, one, uh, one trip into the wonders of mathematics. Okay, what can we do next? So with this, <clears throat> why, why do we need this, this kind of ridiculous form of continuity? It's not continuous at all. Because it says that we can take limits of Ki. Meaning that if we take a sequence of theta i hats that converge to theta i, and we take the limits of these allocation functions, then this limit exists, and furthermore, it is equal to exactly this k i of theta i. That's, that's the only reason we need this kind of continuity. This holds true for almost all theta. And here, almost all is not me being informal. It's, it's how mathematicians call you know all theta i except for a measure zero of theta i. Okay, so this limit exists. And what we wanted to do is, we had this double inequality written on the board, and we want to kind of collapse it together. So we want to push theta hat towards theta i, so that the two allocations on the edges of this inequality would converge to one another because of what we just did. 
right? Because then we will know exactly what the term in the middle is. And uh, the term in the middle was looking like big ui, theta i, theta minus i, minus big ui of theta i hat theta minus i, divided by theta i minus theta i hat. So who can tell me what does this expression converge to when theta i hat converges to theta i? It's the derivative. Thank you, the person on Zoom. So it will be exactly the partial derivative of ui at theta i, theta minus i, with respect to theta i. So what we can conclude at this point is that this limit will exist, once again, because it will be squeezed by these two uh, terms that converge to one another. And in, in Russian, it's called the theorem of the two policemen. So like if you have some value that is squeezed between two things that are converging to each other, then the thing in the middle just also converges to, to that exact thing that both of these converge to. We now know that this derivative exists. And from those inequalities that I've erased, we know that this derivative will be exactly, again, these things. So this derivative will be exactly ki theta i theta minus i. And now, the final step, I want to use the fundamental theorem of calculus that you have all read about in the math notes uh, in the after the first lecture, because you do your homework. So if we take this fundamental theorem of calculus, what can we get? It allows us to go to integrate the derivative and obtain the original function. That's what it does. So we can say that big ui of theta i theta minus i is given by its value at the lowest point, theta bar, bar i theta minus i. So this is a bar, this is a minus. You do not need to take the lowest point, but uh, you can take any point, and this will still be true. Plus the integral from theta bar i to theta i of its derivative for all theta i's in between. And its derivative is this. We know its derivative is just ki. Theta minus i. And here we are integrating over theta i. Actual theta i is taken, so we'll just use letter s to denote the variable of integration. And we get this. The board is a little busy, but we can live with it. So, what did we just get? What did we just get? We see that once we have selected the allocation rule, k, and we've fixed some value of the lowest type, theta i under bar, given theta minus i, these two things pin down utilities of all other types theta i given theta minus i. So if our mechanism is incentive compatible, dominant strategy incentive compatible, then it should satisfy this expression. The utilities it generates for the players should satisfy this expression. So it means 
It means that we cannot really design any fares u that we want. We must satisfy this. The only thing we can choose is we can raise them up or down by a constant given theta minus i. So we only have one degree of flex one, yeah, one degree of flexibility uh, given theta minus i for player i of for player i period. So utilities of all types of player i are pinned down by the utility of the lowest type. Okay. Now. Does this remind you of anything, what we just did? And there can be, in principle, two answers. One from math and the, another one from what we already did in the course. I'll give you the first one. From mathematics, it looks like, um, it looks like the envelope theorem. Have you heard that before, right? It tells you that when you take, well, I guess this previous expression reminds you, should remind you of the Envelope theorem. It says that when you are taking derivative with respect to own type, you only need to take the part of the function that kind of um, explicitly depends on type. So you want, here, when we wrote ui, x also depends on theta i. So in principle, when you are taking the full derivative with respect to theta i, you need to take derivative with respect to this term, the direct tangents of theta i, and you would need to take derivative with respect to x, and they take the derivative of x with respect to uh, report theta i, right? So the envelope theorem says it, you, you do not need to do that second thing. You do not need to take this derivative with respect to x, because um, the agent has already done that, and th they set this derivative to zero, because it's optimal. So it it is similar to the, it is exactly the envelope theorem, and that's the other way you could prove revenue equivalence, a much shorter way. But the thing that it should remind you of this result, this expression, from what we just did, was growth transfers. So if we write those out, you remember we said that we can implement or we can support the efficient social chase function using these growth transfers in principle. Uh, Tig equals to minus the sum j not equal to i, theta i, ki star, theta i, theta minus i, plus j of theta minus i. So you see that here, we are also fixing the social choice function to be efficient. Here it was arbitrary, but if we choose it to be efficient, then we know that we can use these transfers to support the, the, the efficient allocation rule. And we have exactly this degree, this amount of freedom in what else we can choose. So we can choose some other constant for each player that will depend on theta minus i, but it will shift the utilities of player of all types of player i upwards or downwards by a constant, again given theta minus i. So what this result tells us is that growth transfers, this family of transfers for all possible hi, this is the only kind of transfer that implements that supports the official so the efficient social choice function. So all efficient and dominant strategy instead of compatible mechanisms must have transfers that look like this. So all this may have been a little clearer if I stated the actual theorem first. A of equivalence for dominant strategy instead of compatible mechanisms. The theorem says that in the Euclidean setting, for any two dominant strategy instead of compatible direct revelation mechanisms that have the outcome functions given by some x k t and x prime k prime t prime, all of these are of course functions of thetas respectively, the following statement holds. 
if the allocation functions are the same, then the transfers can differ at most by this constant or this constant. So transfers in the first mechanism are equal to the transfers in the second mechanism plus some constant i of theta minus i. I'm saying constant. It's obviously a function of theta minus i. For some theta minus i. So this is the theorem. And as I said, it does allow us to to say something about the, the set of possible transfers with which we can implement a given allocation. It says that once we fix the allocation, there is not much freedom we have in transfers. There can be at most some family of those, and this family is parametrized by this constant. So these payoff equivalents and monotonicity are both necessary properties for the any domain stretches with compatible mechanism in Euclidean setting. So that's true. They both both of these results hold, as I said, slightly beyond Euclidean setting. So you do not need, for example, this multiplicative form of utility. Let us return back to the question that we asked in the beginning of the class. Can we use path equivalents to say whether there is a, um, a mechanism for the bilateral trade problem that is efficient, domain stretch instead of compatible, exposed individually rational, and budget balanced? Now, I would give this problem to uh, for you to solve in class, but I think it's given the little time we have. Uh, I'll just give you the solution straight away. We can use the revenue equivalence principle in the sense that if we want to have the efficient allocation, we must use gross transfers. Oh. So the question is, can we find such functions H that would satisfy both IR and budget balance simultaneously? So we had we had a seller with valuation theta S in zero one. We had a buyer with valuation theta B in theta 1, uh, in 0, 1. We had one item. And so the seller's outside option is just given by their valuation of the, sorry, this is for the seller, US theta S, is just theta S. Meaning that the seller can walk away with the item and get valuation theta s, so we want to give him utility that's at least larger than this. And the buyer has utility, the outside option, 0. B, theta b, equal 0. So what we had in the VCG mechanism was a second price auction, and uh, to just decompose the transfers there, we had for the buyer, the gross transfers were given, can you wait please? Easy writing. Minus theta s in case of trade. Thank you. I should have written that in the center of the board. For the seller, the gross transfers are given by minus theta b. In case of trade. And the h each buyer in the VCG mechanism was given by theta s, it's just theta s, hs, VCG, theta b, given by theta b. Did I? I had my. The first, sorry, the first indicator should be no trade. Thank you. 
yeah, for the buyer. Okay, good. Yeah. This way, if you sum these together for the buyer, you will see that the buyer has to TB VCG theta is given by theta s in case of trade. And um, transfer for the seller in the VCG mechanism is given by theta b in case of no trade. So let's the, the, write out the utilities before we go to the break. If we forget about the HIs, or, or write HIs in general form, we will get that utility for the buyer given type profile theta is given by theta b if they get the item. Uh, indicator of trade. So that's their just valuation for the item. Plus the transfer. So minus minus this thing. So plus theta s indicator no trade. Minus hb of theta s. For the seller, we get theta s, no trade, plus theta b transfer in case of trade, minus hs of theta b. So the question for you during the break is, what are the highest HIs we can select that will render the problem individually rational for the players? Uh, and will those HIs satisfy export budget balance? How do we approach this problem even altogether? Uh, so we are selecting one H for every theta S. So the first thing you can do is just fix theta S. And then fix theta S and then see what happens here. And uh, as we discussed here during the break, it is these indicators are really annoying. So it's maybe easiest if you write these functions out in, in terms of cases. So utility of B equals this if thetas are related this way, and something else is if thetas are related that way. If you do that, you will be able to even draw some graphs that I drew here. In particular, so we are talking about the utility of the buyer, right? But let's start with the seller, <laughs> with the seller first. Because this graph is drawn for, for h seller equal to zero. So how does here on the y-axis we have the seller's equilibrium utility, us, of theta s and theta b, and it's, it's drawn as a function of theta s. And here we fixed some theta b. So if seller's valuation is here, it is below the buyer's valuation, do we have trade? If seller's valuation is lower than the buyer's valuation? No. Uh, uh, other options? Yes. No. <laughs> yes. Right? The buyer values it more, so we want to give the item to the buyer. So we trade the item from the seller to the buyer. So in this case, uh, is seller's utility in case of trade is given by theta b. And we set this h to zero, and this indicator is zero. So it's just theta b. Now, in the other case, when seller's valuation is higher, we give we leave the item with the seller, and then the seller gets utility theta s plus zero minus zero. We this blue line is the utility the seller's utility. And we can change h, and it will shift this utility function up and down, right? 
So we want to choose the highest HS, so to push this function as low as possible, so long as it is above the seller's outside option. And what is the seller's outside option from not participating in the mechanism? It's theta S, right? He can walk away with the item. So this black dashed line is exactly the seller's outside option. U bar S of theta S. So you see that setting this H S at zero, given this theta B and given any theta B, because this is arbitrary, already pushes the seller to the IR constraint. So we cannot do any better. With the buyer, this is the buyer's utility. This is theta B, and we are fixing some theta S. So the graph here is surprisingly the same, but the buyer's outside option is zero. So this HB already pushed us all the way down to the zero, and this is the best HB we can get. And given that, so for HB equal to zero, this function looked like this at theta s. The best HB is exactly theta s. Right? We can push this function down by exactly hs from its benchmark. So VCG already puts the buyer at IR. For the seller, we have to make transfers a little bit higher than VCG. So this h, h equal to zero is the best we can do. Now then, if you calculate the sum of transfers to check budget balance, because this, I think at this point we can come back with all the Zoom people. Come with me, come with me, come with me right here to our main boards. If you calculate the sum of transfers, given the H's that we just calculated, you will see that this problem is not budget balanced. This mechanism is not budget balanced. Which implies what answer to our big question for today? So we know that uh, if we want to implement the efficient allocation K, we must use gross transfers with some H's, right? If we want efficient and domain administration say the capital mechanism. If we want IR, we must choose these H's uh, to so that IR holds. So this is what we just did. If we want budget balance, we want these H's as low as possible. So we actually, sorry, we want highest H's. I confused you there. We want to set H as high as possible because these are agents' payments to the mechanism. All right? So, taking this problem all together, we want to use gross transfers and we want to set H as high as possible while still satisfying IR. So this is what we just did and we saw that this mechanism is not budget balanced. So does there exist any other mechanism that's budget balanced? No, because this is the best we can do. So, we are now officially sad.